and welcome everybody to uh, One Object, Many Stories. I suspect we could have hundreds of stories today. Um, my name is Kaz Cook. I'm delighted to welcome you uh, to this event. It's about an object relating to the 1956 Melbourne Olympics. And um, although it's not appropriate for me to welcome you to country, uh, we'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of this land, the Wurundjeri, the Woiwurrung and Boonwurrung speakers, peoples of, people of the Kulin Nations, the elders past and future, and any who might be with us today. Uh, I reckon if anybody had said that at the opening of the 1956 Olympic Games, they probably would have been crash-tackled to the ground and taken away. It's, um, it's interesting that in 60 years that has changed so much. Um, I will introduce our lovely guests uh, to speak today. Just so that you know, we'll be talking about uh, this object, uh, which is uh, a lamb's wool covered book that was the uh, opening salvo in the bid to bring the Summer Olympic Games to Melbourne in 1956. It was a cross between a bribe, an ad, and an Ugg boot. Uh, and so to have a yarn about the fluffy book today, we have uh, in the middle Tim Hogan, the manager of collection development and discovery here at the State Library. He's been ferreting about in the collections for 18 years in the newspaper archives and Australiana in the form of books, journals and ephemera, which I learned when I was uh, here for a little while, uh, means the printed bits and bobs of our lives that are normally not kept for posterity. So it could be anything from an ad on a beer coaster to a shopping list or a golden gay time wrapper, though I've yet to find that. You would know if there was one in the collection. Um, and on, on the end, Dr. Matthew Klugman, a researcher and historian of sport who comes to us from the Victoria University's Sport in Society Research Program. He's interested in all the interesting parts where sport meets barracking, culture, race, gender, sexuality, religion and migration. And his latest award-winning book is all about the stories behind, and you'll know it, the famous iconic photo of St Kilda player Nicky Winmar pulling up his jumper and pointing at his black skin uh, in 1993. And that book is called Black and Proud, the story of an iconic AFL photo. And next to me, Leon Wiegard, the president of the Olympians Club of Victoria and the national body as well, a member of the Victorian Olympic Council. He represented Australia in water polo at the 1964 Tokyo Olympics and the 1972 Munich Olympics. He's also a very proud Roy boy and former president of the Fitzroy Footy Club. And he was a, a keen schoolboy spectator at the Melbourne Olympics. Uh, so we'll talk for about an hour and directly afterwards we can see a whole lot of treasures from the 1956 Olympics collection here, which will be out in the foyer. And they're only going to be out for about half an hour and then many of them will go away again, possibly for decades. So please, if you can, stop and have a look. So Tim, let's start with you. Uh, there were only a handful of these books made in 1949 and surely they didn't run out of sheepskin. So wh why such an exclusive print run? What was it? Four. Didn't run out of sheepskin. <laughs> um, plenty of wool in Australia in those days. Look, the the way they sort of took the bid for the games, you know, this this book, this object we're talking about is a is a very uh, beautiful book about Melbourne, meant to showcase Melbourne to the International Olympic Committee. And there were quite a there were five hundred of these books produced, but they produced, we think, twelve deluxe editions. The, the 12 had the, the wool covering and they were really, from what I can tell, were reserved for the, the, the real VIPs. One, for instance, was given to the King of England. I imagine he was <laughs> thrilled. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I don't think he even had a vote on the, um, on, the, uh, right. on, on, on the bid, but, you know, that's the sort of thing we did in those days. The royals always got something. Um, so... So they, were, they did the... Special fluffy edition did go to the decision makers, though. Yes, yes. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure one went to the president of the International Olympic Committee. And this was done in London in 1948 when the London Games were on, uh, the London Olympics. and uh, that, So some of the uh, people who were trying to win the right to host the Games for Melbourne were over there and they had these books and they, had, they would have had the 12 fluffy, <laughs> fluffy books and they were given to the really important people, that's, that's what uh, we understand to have ha happened. And then the other you know, ones were covered in suede, similar book. The, the what same colour? 
That was white and it was sort oh. of a white suede sort of cover. So they only went to people who wore gloves all the time, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And they were sent out over time to all the uh, delegates of the International Olympic Committee. So there, there were 500 overall, but these, these ones were really a special super deluxe edition. Mm, you could pat these ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's have a look at... Um, that's the, the, that was the first page saying, you know, give us a, a go. Um, and this is how they wanted um, Australia to be seen. Um, a city of culture and civic consciousness. Um, and Matthew, that looks like Hansel and Gretel lost in the Fitzroy Gardens in the middle, uh, in, in that beautiful ray of, uh, you know, transforming sunlight. And that's um, not the William Anglis College. What was the um, cooking school called? Emily McPherson, thank you. Um, Actually, there's a beautiful collection here of all the things from there as well. But what are they saying, Matthew, about Melbourne? What do they want us to think about Melbourne with, with these photos? Yeah, I think it's a, a fascinating portrayal of, um, you know, how the people putting the bid wanted Melbourne to be seen on, on a kind of international stage. And the, the recurring theme through all of it is that Melbourne is modern, you know, young, modern, industrial city. There's, there's all these straight lines all the way through, very clean, kind of almost pure representations. That that one with the children there is um, one of the only times you get to see identifiable figures. Yeah. So very proper, uh, respectable, civilised. There's it, this kind of does. sense that Melbourne is a very civilised place. It actually looks uninhabited, <laughs> largely. Um, and then, so they did want to tell us about the people, but the thing they wanted us to know about the people was we like sport. Mm. That was the main thing. Um, so that's cricket on the left and people fondling each other at the beach on the right, neither of which became Olympic sports. But um, what, what were they saying? What was the image of Australia or, or Australians? Australia already had a bit of a sense of being sports mad. Uh, you know, Mark Twain comes over here in the um, mid-1890s and, and writes about the Melbourne Cup and the fuel for that. So they're, they're building on that kind of passion for sport. But again, you never see any pictures of people being too passionate. So big crowds, but not, um, not uncivilised. Clapping with their gloves on, yes, maybe. Yes, yes. Um, uh, and then the beaches, they, they want to give yeah, Melbourne as a destination. Yeah, okay. So you can have a holiday if you come as well. Yeah, and I mean the quote for that beaches one is um is quite beautiful. It it's uh um how does it say for oh, mile the, after mile gently shelving golden sand beaches stretch around the clear broad waters of Port Phillip Bay. <laughs> so it's, it's very lyrical. My theory is that they let the newspaper writers off the leash and they were so excited that they got to write sort of a bit a bit more poetically. Um because part of the, the... The bid was really run by sort of respectable businessmen and they all have got their name in this book. Um, you can see if you, if you um, can pause to have a look at it. Um, and also the major newspapers of the day as well who would have presumably somehow printed the book mm -hmm. at cost or... Yeah, and later there becomes a tension about um, the people who kind of want the Olympics to be a symbol of Melbourne as modern and build a new stadium and... Um, to pick Melbourne that way, and the people who are more interested in Melbourne as traditional. Uh, All right, so we'll get to the buildings yeah. they pretended they were going to build in a minute. But here are the, they say that we've got some interesting animals, and that is a great photo of kangaroos, I must say, and platypus and sheep. <laughs> um, there's always a photo of sheep, isn't there, when, um, when Australia's being well, presented? It, well, it was a wool-covered book, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But that's, you know, th that's something that reminds me of when people were talking about MacArthur and, you know, Australia was founded on the sheep's back and this is, you know, this is 100 years after that but we're still, we cannot stop banging on about the sheep. <laughs> the, the other really interesting thing I think about the sheep is because this is the place where they say Australia is unique and exotic and yet at the end of that section you've still got the sheep. So the landscape is never presented as wild or untamed. Right. Uh, it, it's, and, and here's the kind of... It's, it's been civilised. So, so the only photos are of the beach and the city. So there's... 
nothing that represents the interior or well there's the one of ma there's one of mountains but with the mountains you s they what they present is the road and a car on it we've got and roads and then the and then the caption says you know in a series of hairpin bends an excellent well graded road climbs for more than 3600 feet so again it's about modernity and this kind of taming so a little bit like rio isn't it we've got a road <laughs> We, we won't kill too many people who come. It's a little bit like Rio and, and there's also, yeah, there's this kind of, the old world is Europe and Australia's a new world. There's no sense, you know, if you said of, of any acknowledgement of Aboriginal people here, of, of any prior history to this new modern city. And Leon, uh, transfixed by their furry books, they did vote to have it in Melbourne by one vote. I think we sneaked in. Um, and, and you got to see that as a schoolboy. I'm wondering, did you already have a s sporting ambitions or was it being there caught up in the excitement of the Olympics in, a, in 1956 that made you want to be an Olympian? Uh, yes, the, um, uh, the bid was won by one vote, as you said, uh, over Buenos Aires. And it was the first uh, Olympics to be in the Southern Hemisphere. And that's why I think they were pretty keen to show all those sophisticated shots of Melbourne to prove that we weren't an outback. Right. area you know and that because people didn't know much about the southern hemisphere in those days i was already a sports kid because i went to a christian brother's school and uh, they were very good at teaching latin and sport <laughs> and other matters we found out about later but um they were mad on sport and therefore anyone that went the christian brothers pretty well uh it was handball football and uh, water polo for you well no well that came from the swimming part of it i think um um uh, unusual sports more Small sports like water polo, you are, you usually fall into them or your parents did it or something, you know, it's an interesting way. I did it because everywhere our parents moved to there was a swimming pool. So myself and my three brothers were pretty natural at it and we, um, we picked it up that way. But you're quite right, the, having the Olympics here in 56 was the absolute catalyst uh, required by a young bloke like me. That was it. From then on it was onward and upward. So what did you go to? I went to, well, I went to everything I wanted to. Um, um, I went to school with Keith Stackpole, and any cricketers among the crew here. He was vice-captain later in life in the Australian team. We sat next to each other for many years. We went down to the any event we wanted to go to and said, Mum's got our tickets inside. In you go. <laughs> no, amazing, they'd shoot you on site now. How old were you? Well, a schoolboy, I, I guess, in those days. Well, I'll give it away, I guess. I, I, I guess I must have been 16 or 15 or something yeah. like that, or 17. I, Wow. In that area. So you saw, did you see any of the water polo? Saw as much as I could. Um, uh, played a lot of practice matches because at that time I was a young bloke. Um, we had a, a team playing in the A grade here in uh, Victoria made up of younger players. You had to be under 18 or 19 or something called the Colts and we played against the grown guys in that competition. So um, I was ready for big guys water polo and so I played practice matches against all these countries great experience wow. got the the Jesus kicked out of me but I really enjoyed <laughs> it immensely well we'll come back to um, a bit of a kicking in the water polo um, Tim I want to ask you if if all this excitement in Melbourne uh, before the games and because of the games was it kind of because there was nothing else to do in Melbourne was it, was it <laughs> you know, or am I just being judgmental about those those photos and the fact that they didn't seem to be, there was no cafe society to speak of yeah. we, you know wasn't we yeah. weren't multicultural yet um, or, oh. or was there a sense you know as Leon says that we were showing to the world that didn't know anything about us that we were still a world city like we were in the 1880s and then we kind of lost it yeah, uh, the latter. I think that we definitely wanted to um, showcase ourselves to the world, and I, I think there was a fairly, um, you know, uh, strong belief uh, and perception that we were relatively sophisticated and cultural and and civilized. And um, we might have been wrong, a little, perhaps, but that was the belief. And um, you and know, yet, I, still part of the empire. That was yeah, important, wasn't it? Still, still empire conscious. I mean. The, the book, the invitation book that we've got here talks about being part of the empire. So the Commonwealth terminology hadn't quite taken over then. Uh, but now look, one, one of the people involved in, in the bid 
spoke about uh, wanting to make Australia more well known to the world, and he and he spoke about um, the rest of the world's abysmal knowledge. I think it's the the so term he used. It was quite cross. <laughs> abysmal knowledge or, or appalling knowledge of uh, lack of awareness about Australia, uh, including in British dominions. He added, <laughs> so so th there was certainly a keenness to push Australia's position and image in the world, and then the business community were quite keen on it too, because they, they saw commercial op opportunities. Yeah, um, and I was just thinking, because the Queen then toured in, in 54, mm. so that hadn't happened yet. That was probably the second most exciting thing that ever happened. Well, that was massive, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as, as yeah. many people would might remember or know. But uh, no, this was, this was happening in 1948, uh, 48, 49 is when That's the initial so bidding and the wooing and the, you know, the whining and dining of all the, the delegates and, and all our pr putting our best foot forward. So as Matthew and, Matthew and Leon were saying, it was about presenting a, you know, a, a pretty sophisticated image to the world, but also one a little bit exotic as well. Yeah, <laughs> the platypuses. Um, <laughs> let's have a look at, uh, you know, those clean lines that Matthew was talking about. That's... Um, the Olympic Stadium, rather Trumpian in style, I would say, um, which didn't get built. It actually, the, in, in uh, one of the, in the pretend aerial photo, which is that one, it actually looks like they were going to nail up bits around the MCG to make it look like the Olympic Stadium. And I think they just kind of stuck with the MCG. And that was the proposed Olympic swimming pool um, with giant lettuces growing around it. And that didn't happen either, did it? Well, the we, pool we got a pool, but we didn't get that one. Well, the pool they finished up building, which was designed by McIntyre, was uh, won a, a World Architecture Prize that year in 1956, and it's still in use now. Uh, mm. Probably people in the Olympic Games are, um, uh, wouldn't be overly pleased to know that Collingwood Footy Club have taken it over. Um, <laughs> but it, did, it had a couple of uh, uh, resurrections after swimming. It had basketball for a while, you recall. And so it's had a, a great deal of use. Great building. That's good. Oh, the, the one they built is great. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Well, maybe they just, by the time they got to actually build it, they'd found someone who knew what they were doing. But, Kaz, there was, that was an absolute point of conflict in the lead up to the games. W what stadiums they were going to have, where they were going to build them, who was going to benefit from them. You know, it was, it was a tremendous sort of battle well, between uh, competing interests and uh, organisations. Uh, notice that in that list in the book of people who were sponsoring the fluffy books, there's a lot of. I mean, Cyclone was the fence company, wasn't it? And there was a pipe company in there. So there is a building feel to that. You wanted to say something, Matthew? Well, the, the Games is always taken away from Melbourne uh, because of inaction. Uh, when Avery Brundage uh, visits um, in the early 50s, he's, he's appalled and he, he, got, he's on, he, he goes public with it, which doesn't tend to happen so much these days. Uh, he, he, he was the president of the... Yeah, Olympic the president Committee. of the yeah. International Olympic Committee. Uh, and... Uh, and that, that finally leads to some action. But, yeah, the, the, at one point the showgrounds were going to be redeveloped and, and the whole uh, main stadium was going to be there. And, and there, were, there were many, many uh, designs. And was it the first purpose-built uh, Olympic village for athletes? The one that's ended up being public housing in Heidelberg? Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, the previous games in Helsinki, uh, there was some sort of barracks... Uh, it was something a bit like a village, but this was the first. I guess it depends built. on what you call it. If you call it <laughs> barracks, you don't want to stay. But if you call it a village, it sounds yeah. great. Well, but because they were also separated, there were two villages, male and female. I thought it was the first time they were allowed. No, a great to fence between them. Um, oh, that'd be the cyclone company. Yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> but there was controversy about that because it was only a fence. And it was ineffective. It was only a fence. <laughs> it was only a fence. <laughs> what? They didn't check for tunnels. They, they didn't have them in separate areas. Yes. <laughs> oh wow. Um, Matthew, it's so hard to separate politics from sport and these Olympics were no exception. I was, you know, shocked at my own ignorance when I looked it up and realised how many countries boycotted the 1956 Games mm. um, because of the Suez Crisis, uh, Egypt, Iraq, Lebanon didn't come, because the Soviet Union had just invaded Hungary, Holland, Spain and Switzerland, China stayed away because Taiwan was in. Uh, it wasn't broadcast at, to all the overseas networks because they were boycotting because of the price of the rights. You know, was, was that an awakening for Australians or were they pretty 
were they used to watching the world because of the war? And it's only sort of 10 years, really, after the end of the war. I think in some ways it's a reawakening, particularly around the Cold War. Um, and when you read the newspaper reports, you, you see these underlying themes. The, the, the games become called the Friendly Games and the Argus had... The, the Friendly Games, the, yeah. The, 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 one of the main Melbourne broadsheets at the time, the Argus, had kind of started calling them the Friendly Games in the lead-up to the games. But at the same time, you have these, these mentions of war and peace. Um, you know, Soviet subs, um, you know, doom Australia and the water polo is, is, is one of the head... Headlines and and then you know the pieces shattered another point so and and there was disappointment that that it wasn't going to be the As the friendly. most well attended games of oh, all okay. you know the, there's a big um, lift out uh, which details all the countries but it begins by expressing disappointment that it's it's not going to be um, a record number of countries so yeah I, I think there starts to be an awareness. But at the same time, the kind of legacy doesn't talk about that much. Um, it doesn't locate it, or it locates it within the Cold War, but then it kind of, uh, it, it talks about sport as, as for friendship purposes, and, and, the, and the games do that most notably uh, in the closing ceremony. But at the same time, those other politics are rife and continue uh, shaping, shaping the games. And, and Leon, um, you know, that would have been nowhere more obvious than at the water polo game between Russia and Hungary, which, which is, you know, I wasn't even born yet, but that's, that's the takeaway point that I, I think about. Um, tell us about that. What was that like at the time to see it or hear about it? And can you just describe it for people who might not know? Well, it was only a few, uh, a very few weeks, uh, only uh, less than a couple of months um, since the Soviets... Uh, invaded um, Budapest and of course killed a lot of people and um, um, it was a shocking international thing and um, by that time the Hungarian team were already on the way here so they weren't going to pull out. The Russians were also coming by boat and by the way they sh they had to ship and uh, house the Russians on board that boat at Appleton Dock and Appleton Dock is down at w what we now uh, in the modern age call um, South Bank. So that was an absolute dreadful place. Oh, so the Russians were quarantined there for their own safety. For their own safety, and um, and it was a um, dreadful part of the world. You know, it was dark and dingy, and talk about cyclone fences. It it was a uh, uh, barbed wire all over the place, and tumbleweed was a godforsaken place. Anyway, that's where they were. Uh, regarding that match, I actually didn't see that one game, um, but Peter Bennett was. Um, uh, in the Australian team, and he was a star full forward for St Kilda, and a great character, by the way. He died a couple of years ago. Uh, he told me that Ungo started it. Well, water polo matches are often, you know, there's a lot of facial injuries anyway, so whether that was a direct punch or not, or an elbow, elbows are the most lethal thing in water polo. So, so this is the famous, the famous photo of the Hungarian player with gone, blood running down yeah, his face. Yeah, and he... And it was a serious... I mean, he had to be stitched up, but that's not an unusual thing. But it did make the world... And that's the, the big takeout, isn't it, of the 56 Olympics? This yeah. Thing. Those two teams, right up till recent times, used to meet regularly with each other now. they become great friends. So that's a nice thing uh, as a yeah. after script, I guess. And, and at the time, it was sort of seen, I think, as, you know, a replay or an emblem of the war that was going on back in Hungary. Oh, yeah, that's right, um, yeah. That photo up there is the clean-cut Australian water polo team who look like they'd never throw an elbow in their lives. Um, one thing that was I was really amazed about was... Um, well, I, it didn't surprise me that a lot of the Hungarian players wanted to stay and defect, but several of them didn't know that was possible because they were up at the rowing, and so they didn't hear this gossip that had been going around the Heidelberg um, barracks, village, um, about it, and and the thing that really broke my heart was the the famous swimmer who I think collected a couple of gold medals. She was so worried about her um, toddler that she'd left behind in Hungary. She lost six kilos before her races, so didn't perform the way that was expected. And when she got home, she found out that her her husband had defected. He was also in the team. I mean, just th those human stories. Um, did well, you, were you aware of that at the time? Did it feel like that? Did it feel dramatic? There were rumours about what the rumours were. And uh, the word propaganda uh, wasn't used very often, but that's what it was. The, the um, 
very powerful propaganda by the Russians, and of course the Hungarians had another view. And uh, but I, I, they did keep all the true information away from those poor Hungarians. They didn't know the ones that stayed were very brave people because mm. they left their family back there, and consequences were there, and um, and they finished up. All those people that stayed had a huge impact on sport in Australia. They were wonderful athletes, but. Um, for their personal lives, they were ruined forever, you know, because they, uh, they weren't, if you remember, able to go back there for 25 years. Yeah. So it was a shocking personal thing. Um, now, there is the clean cut, 1956 water Don't polo I can't quite team. see Peter Bennett be in there smiling somewhere. Might be it? able to, if you can twist, quite a character. twist round, but he's big, bigger up there. Um, but check this out. Oh, yeah, well, that's a great team, that one. That is Leon right there in his speedos. Uh, those are the days. What a guy. I'm sure you look exactly like that out of your suit. Well, we're still good mates. A lot of those guys, three of are those you? guys are dead, but the rest of us uh, see each other regularly. Were you the rock stars of the era? Did people give no, you free No, one, no one knew us at all. Uh, really? <laughs> no, well, uh, you know, as I said, we, we, we understand our position. Water pilot, a lot of sports in the Olympics, you know, you wouldn't. I'll tell you an example. Gymnastics, you can't get a ticket at the Olympics for gymnastics. It sells like that. But you can go to the... Austra the United States Championships, the Soviet Championships, the Australia, and you walk in the door, sit where you like. Is the it same athletes go to the Olympics and you can't get a ticket to see them. Is it because you can't see your legs? In water polo, well, you talk about that pool in 56 they built, you could go under that and they had big glass windows. You could see what was happening oh, under the wow. water polo. Yeah. Oh, great. And it was a great uh, vantage spot to be. You had to know someone to get down there, though. And this has got nothing to do with anything, but I just want to know, did you keep your togs on most of the time? Well, or as I said, most of the injuries in water polo, men's water polo, women play now, of course, but in those days, men's water polo, there are a lot of rumours about what would happen to you physically in a match, but it is all facial. Cut eyebrows, broken noses, teeth knocked out, burst in drums, facial. Well, do you? But if you do get kicked down there, the facial pull's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> um, Matthew, uh, how did spectators barrack at the 1956 Olympics if we were presented as this sedate mob? Um, you know, what happened at the actual gig? Did people scream? I know some people wore, made their own ribbons and, you know, they wanted to be, I think, special colours for special athletes. And, di and, you know, did women come and misbehave? What was it like? Yeah, despite... Um, yeah, there were some anxieties beforehand about how welcoming Melbourne would be um, and some concerns it wasn't going to be so welcoming. But people worked very hard to be, to be welcoming. And so uh, a lot of athletes were kind of taken under wings. That There was, you know, the Hungarian um, migrants were pretty brutal about the Soviets. But other Soviet athletes were celebrated. You know, there was famous stories of, of, um, of one of the runners being taken as kind of becoming a crowd favourite. Um, and a real cult hero. So there was that embracing of... Uh, I think the sense Melbourne had of itself was that it, even, even though it had changed a lot uh, since 48 and 49, uh, there was already more than a million immigrants, uh, particularly from the Mediterranean Europe, who'd come. The sense Melbourne still had of itself was of British white uh, stock, but it wanted to embrace the rest of the world at that time. So it was a really interesting moment in Melbourne's history in terms of the white Australia policy was still active. A lot of people who came as athletes wouldn't have otherwise been able to migrate to Australia. And yet there was this embrace. So uh, there aren't so many stories of wildness so much, but yeah, women and men being passionate, um, but in, a, in more generally friendly ways. Yeah. Um Tim, you compiled an amazing website about the lead-up and, and the games. Um, and there are some really fabulous stories uh, on that website. The excited rower who threw his gold medal into Lake Wendouree after he won. Couldn't find the medal. Um, three Irishmen who turned up on bikes and nearly took part in the cycling road race until someone noticed and went, get off your bike. Um, tell us how we can access that website. Um, and, and do you think the Olympics changed, you know that feeling in Melbourne? Do, is that yeah. the sense you get from the, the collection and your yes. building of that website? Uh, just the, the Irish cyclists, by the way, I think they were protesting about, you know, the, they were sort of IRA, or maybe not IRA, but they were Irish nationalists, so they were having a bit of a protest and they tried to join the, the race and got found out. So that was a, a curious incident. Uh, 
Look, uh, it certainly changed Melbourne. I mean, many people have written about how that was, you know, part of the beginnings of Melbourne's great cosmopolitanisation, if you want to invent a word or use a word like that. I mean, one thing I remember learning about doing a bit of research on the Olympics was that, you know, they needed a lot of um, cooks who could, who could cook meals for actual people food. from... Yeah, yeah, yeah actual <laughs> food. People who could cook uh, meals for people from many different parts of the world. And we just didn't have the people who could do that. So they went on recruiting drives into Europe and other places. So they went on a, 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 and brought a, a lot of uh, chefs in. And then after the game, some of those actually stayed in Australia. So, you know, you've got the sort of the stirrings of our cuisine becoming a little bit more... Um, you know, varied, uh, I guess. Well, I'm guessing um, the, I know there's a menu upstairs for the um, the Olympic Organising Committee uh, official lunch. I'm guessing they didn't go to an Asian fusion restaurant. No, no, I, I think the, the menu, when they were whining and dining the officials back in the late 40s winning the bid, it was it was fairly traditional fare. We hadn't, we hadn't got our um, European or Asian cooks coming in by that stage. A bit of custard. <laughs> <laughs> Something boiled within an inch of its life. Probably lamb, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, or mutton, if they were very unlucky. But, uh, but yeah, look, the website is, you can... So, yeah, you know, I, I, myself and a colleague did a, uh, a website on this, or a few colleagues, but myself and another colleague wrote the content. And you can just uh, find it on the, the State Library of Victoria uh, website if you just type in 1956 Melbourne Olympics, it'll come up. Or it's also on Trove. People might know about Trove, the, um, the National Library's coordinated site. But it's just called the 1956 Melbourne Olympics. Type that in and it will appear and you'll see pictures and stories and, yeah. and a bit of an overview uh, and one or two incidents like the, uh, the bike riders. Um, part of the ethos of, of, of the 1950s uh, games matched the official sexism of the time, but... Um, two unconventional women heroes were all about their sport and not about wearing gloves and taking tea. And um, they became, you know, household names really from, from then on. And that's uh, Golden Girl, she was called Betty Cuthbert. Um, Leon, she said that she ran with her mouth open because that's how she looked when she put effort into anything. Um, you would have met her many times, I'm sure. Um, it, it, what, is that right, that sort of... Because uh, I had this impression of her as just a no-nonsense, lovely girl from a country town who did her best. You know, there's something kind of simple in a, in, a, in a great way about that. Country New South Wales, beautiful girl. And in 1956, as a schoolboy, I was in love with her. Yeah, um, you would be. So was half the nation, though. Mm. Um, uh, Dawn also... Um, uh, no, uh, another character uh, of a different type. Um, there's Dawn. Both were... Uh, the connection that I had directly with them was, apart from admiring them uh, in 56 as a schoolboy, by the time 70, uh, 64 came around, uh, they were both still on the team. Dawn won her third uh, 100 metres, which had never been done before, and Betty made one of the great comebacks f of all time. She won three gold, I think, in Melbourne, went to um, uh, Rome and was ill there. She wasn't informed, she was injured and, and, and didn't do a great deal. And came back and won the 400 metres, which was a lot in further 64. than she'd ever swum in 64. Uh, run in 64, she won again. A wonderful, wonderful runner and um, beautiful lady. She's still alive, living in uh, Western Australia. She's a paraplegic these days, or she's confined to a wheelchair. She needs 24-hour uh, help. Um, but until a couple of years ago, we used to bring her across for all of our Olympians' dinners. Each year, she'd come. You had to bring two helpers with her. That's our what cha lovely lady. Dawn, uh, you see her on television now doing ads and all that. She's still robust and uh, a bit of a character around she's, town. She's got a lovely mischief in her eye there. Uh, she's got a lot of mischief in <laughs> her, everything. You know? <laughs> she, she's a bit different now, Dawny. Um, <laughs> were you a bit, were you naughty in 1964? Did you, or were you too busy? In 64? Yeah. Oh, I guess I was. I, um... I was a water polo player for a start. That gave you a heads up. Any of the team sports have got a lot of naughtiness about them. Yeah, because um, you Oh, on. yeah, we, we did things. Um, but in, f uh, in those days, you could do things differently. You know, uh, too many people associated with team sports now, psychiatrists and psychologists and dietitians, and I don't think it means that much difference, frankly, for team sports. 
Uh, we rely very much on um, uh, teamwork and getting together, understanding each other much better. And therefore, a few beers, you know, after a game and all that sort of stuff. These days, they'd frown on all that sort of stuff. But our people had greater longevity than they have these days. And they're almost professional too, so that adds pressure to it. So it was a different sort of dynamic entirely. Yeah, so you weren't... Much more relaxed. Yeah, you weren't considered role models and heroes in that way, I suppose, particularly in a team sport. Within our own sport we were. You know, mm. you'd have kids... And all of us did that. We all coached when we got back, all looked after junior squads and state teams and uh, I, I even coached the Victorian women's team. And I was against women being involved at that time. I thought oh, it was. Oh, were you? Why? Well, I didn't think it was a women's sort of sport. And oh, I, you're a I dill, said, Leon? Well, I probably say, so, but don't think we're going back yeah, 40 no, years. Yeah, you're right now. <laughs> well, some of them, I've, I'm the, we've got a boxer coming up shortly, and women's boxing. I, I don't know whether the Olympics actually need that, or I don't know whether women need to be boxing each other around. I, but anyway, it's another matter. But they. I'm with you. I don't think anyone should be boxing. Kangaroos, people. Yeah, I'm but, against it. <laughs> but. Um, um, so all of us got involved and we were, I guess, looked up to because it was the, the plum. Even league footballers, and I had a lot to do with league football, they used to admire Olympians, no matter what sport you were in. Yeah, it because is they the didn't pinnacle, have that. They it? didn't have that international aspect to it. Um, Matthew, I'm wondering what sort of difference you see as a historian in, in the worship of... Um, and there is something special about Olympians, isn't there? Even in what, you know, Leon modestly says water polo is a little sport. But, you know, best in the world, best in the, your country. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if the worship has changed so much as the um, prurience. <laughs> you know, the, the, there's a lot of um, stories that weren't told publicly, um, you know, of, of, of About of private mischief. lives. Yeah, um, which are told now. Uh, so I think... You know the, the 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 nature of the media has changed a lot, but there's still, you know, uh, it's interesting. I think if you if you talk about the 1956 Olympics, they're really interesting in terms of media because internationally it's it's still not covered um, very broadly at all by because as you said, TV rights and the difficulty of of um, uh, of getting equipment here and and the crews here. But in Australia. It, it's this huge TV event that is, um, for a lot of people, it's the dawn of TV, you know, and it's the first time they watched. And so it, it becomes this place where you could see your heroes um, on TV, which becomes the pattern that's then set. And I think every time the Olympics rolls around, still it, it's largely a TV event for, for us. Um, and, and that becomes this kind of medium where people see their heroes and, and want to be their heroes. So it, it kind of starts creating that, that model of um, of seeing them in action e through a TV screen often, but a bit being able to have that kind of connection. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And and also it was the first time I think that um, souvenirs were mass produced for a sporting event or for sporting heroes. Um, were there swap cards and things, Leon? Were you ever? I, I think they were a big anyway for everything. Footy and cricket and uh, swap oh, cards right, were very okay. big. And all, all school kids had uh, swap cards. I think uh, uh, we didn't have swap phone numbers. As they do now, but um, but swap cards, selfies, uh, selfies. Yeah, um, it was. Uh, uh, gee, was it Did six? Did you have them when you were at school? I don't boy? recall having s time. I was very active as a kid, you know, doing all sorts of things, you know. And kids were. We we did mm. paper rounds and did our sports and did about five sports. You know, you played everything and uh, you were trying to get your school work done a bit. Um, <laughs> so that wasn't an important thing, but it, uh, it had to be done. So. I think we're much busier doing a whole lot of other things in those days than we are now, and that's why they go to the digital age now. They've got nothing else to do. <laughs> so what have you kept from 1956, or is most of your memorabilia from when, after you became an Olympian? Well, 56, well I had, didn't have any tickets in 56. You didn't <laughs> no, need them, obviously. So, hold on to your tickets. But I, 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 I think memories are there. I mean, I still remember... You asked a question before about the attitude of an Australian or... The, um, the crowds in Australia to, say, the Russians. Well, I remember watching, and it's still very, very clear and vivid in my mind, Vladimir Kutz winning the long distance running in, around the MCG. Well, Russian as you can get. And um, uh, he was loudly applauded, you know, and people... So they'd forgotten. I think that's a... There's a fairness about it. And 
mm. people would have understood here's an athlete probably had nothing to do with the political decisions, obviously. Although his ranking in 1956, I don't know whether you've got this on record, but he was a submarine commander, which was not bad for a 22-year-old bloke that never been to sea. Really? Uh, but so he, be he became a real cult figure, didn't he? Like a cult figure, and he died a huge figure. He's about 24 stone uh, when he died a few years ago, so the vodka got to him, but... Um, well, it's true, apparently, unfortunately, but great athlete. He had this ability to go very, very fast for a while and, and, and break their hearts, and then he'd slow down and give them a bit of hope. And when he could hear them coming behind him, oh. he'd go again. So he was and a showboat as well? Well, it, no, his way of running. He just yeah, had that. Okay. Most athletes can't do that. You mm. can't just run very quickly, then stop for a while, then press another button. You have to be very but confident, don't you? He had this capacity. He may well have been on something we knew nothing about. I was going to ask <laughs> you about that. You know, talking of gossip at the time, was there any talk yet about people being on the gear? My word, it was called... Really? Fosters. <laughs> 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 Helped a lot of us get through. Yeah, all right. Um, Tim, let's have a look at some of the souvenirs that people will be seeing in the foyer because there, there really was an explosion, wasn't there? Suddenly, I think there's the, the uh, first plastic bag out yeah. there was used for the... Yeah, look, it, it kind of pervaded so many aspects of life. I mean, I've, I've seen, yeah, uh, early plastic bags, um, scarves, uh, you yeah, know, that's, tea that's towels, scarf. cups, ashtrays, you know. Um, that scarf, I reckon, is a bit of a slapdash job. There's a, a few, a couple of Olympic sc scarves in this collection, and that one, see how it's sort of the same Australia on every corner, isn't it? So I reckon someone did that in a week yeah. and <laughs> rushed it out for the... Um well, that's getting back to that commercial opportunity aspect. I mean, people yeah. were even making bricks with Olympic rings on them. Um, so oh, wow. And, and they're now a collector's item. So if anyone's got an, a, an old brick at home, just check and see if there's a few Olympic rings on it. <laughs> the company that did that got, got into a bit of trouble, actually, from the Olympic authorities because oh, so they were protective of... Yeah. There was already a thing about you have to, had to be official about your branding. Yes, there, there was. Yeah. Um, now, it might be a bit hard to see. Oh, no, you can see that that's a jigsaw. Um, but why was that moment so important, anybody? That's Ron Clark. And wasn't there something what? about him? That's he, the he last leg of the tour. That's the last. Uh, he was the, uh, the world junior mile record holder at the time. His brother was uh, captain of Essendon Footy Club, Jack Clark. And... Uh, he was already breaking world records as a junior and went on to break more records. Sadly, in two Olympics, uh, Ron only won a bronze medal, only won a bronze medal, but he was favourite every time. Really? And he he died a couple of years ago, uh, no, last year. Um, Ron made the mistake of uh, blaming the other competitors for not taking their turn in front. He was a distance runner, uh -huh. uh, which was a silly thing to do um, because in the Olympics, uh, time is not important. Ron was a time runner and no better ever. And fastest man, absolutely no, no dispute. As far as winning is concerned, there are ways of doing it. And one is not necessarily to be the fastest all the time. So uh, it's easy in retrospect to say those things, but that, that's what happened with Ron. He was a wonderful athlete and, um, and that photo is iconic. There's two, the one where he got scalded or burned. Yeah, that's what I was going to... Um, so wasn't there something about... So he's not getting burned here, but Well, he, he was a bit... I, I, I was in the stadium that day and there were flame... Uh, uh, what do you call cinders coming yeah, out? Yeah, it does look like he's going ow, ow, ow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and more so when he gets to the top of the steps. Yeah. And uh, put, uh, uh, that was another mistake by the Gas and Fuel Corporation, I think, as it was called in those days. Not just L their buildings. They're supposed to have had a <laughs> shocker, wasn't it? <laughs> they, had a, they had a little... Uh, I think it was a... Have you seen the Olympic torch? It's got a little gas bottle, I think, and... So they got, I don't know, the, the gas flow was wrong or something. Anyway, it's an iconic photo. Yeah, it's beautiful. And this, I like this because it's kind of fancy but really restrained at the same time. That was the uh, Tim the... Yeah, the I mean, they had official cars. Oh, I think they had about a 1,000 cars that were... 1,000 cars? Something like that, yeah. It was quite a lot. I mean, for all the officials and, and uh, you know, lots of people associated with the games. And um, so that was a little pennant that's uh, part of our... That, that's part of the um, uh, Edward Doyle collection here. Edward Doyle was a, uh, one of the organisers of the Games and his collection of material uh, in the 1960s found its way 
here to the library. Do you reckon library. he uh, just nicked that off his aerial one day <laughs> and said, I'll just probably pop that in my pocket? It, it probably was his own one. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. But, um, yeah, they were put on the cars to, to signify. They also had a, a, a number plate, a games number plate, and, and they had a little car passes, which we've got an example here, which people can have a look at afterwards. But, yeah, it's, it's a, a nice little item, that, just to say you're driving around in the official Olympic car. I'm definitely going to get something for my aerial. I'm not sure what yet. <laughs> hey, um, the other thing I wanted to ask was, I mean, all of these things to me have their own interest and, you know, or I love the way they're printed or... But what, are people, what do people pay big money for in terms of... I mean, I'm guessing it would be the medals the themselves. Medals, the medals are the really big ones. Um, uh, one of Jesse Owens, you know, incredibly famous athlete, one of his medals was sold for over a million dollars. I think that's a, one of the highest prices paid for... Jesse Owens, the African-American African -American runner at the 1936... At, at the Berlin Olympics, yeah. Um, the one that uh, Hitler wasn't too fond of. <laughs> um, yeah, so the medals, but, I mean, you know, there, there, there's, a, there's a pretty healthy trade in Olympic memorabilia. Um, you know, one of the people might not know about the games here. We, we couldn't have the, um, the horse, the equestrian events here uh, in Melbourne. Quarantine. Because we had very strict uh, quarantine regulations and, and it took such a long time for the horses to go through quarantine and they had to come by boat anyway. It just became too complex to have them here. So the equestrian events were actually staged in Stockholm and they, they had their own little, must have had their own little torch ceremony over there. And one of the torches for that ceremony was, was in the, worth in the hundreds of thousands of dollars because it's such a unique little part of the, the history of the Games. But, um, yeah, yeah that's, some of the items are really absolute collector's pieces. Uh, Kaz, sadly, um, a lot of our Australian athletes who won gold medals years and years ago, even in this era, uh, are having to sell their medals to survive because they, no. they didn't make any money in those days. All no. We were the last of the lily whites and... Um, so it's a bit sad to see that happening and uh, it's just nice that we've had so many um, wealthy Australians who have a great attitude about life who are buying these things and giving the money to the, to the athlete and often giving the medals back to the athlete as well. Oh, really? So that's happened on a couple of occasions and, of course, you don't want to say who they are but they're some of the best-known Olympians from this era and around about that that have had to do that. There must be um, an almost automatic camaraderie between those men and women who were in the Olympics? Well, it's a funny thing, a, a, a sad thing, but funny at the same time. Uh, as you said at the introductions, I'm president of the Olympians Club of Victoria and Australia. In 19, or some years ago, um, Raylan Boyle rang me to say that uh, a swimmer from the 1968 Mexico team uh, had breast cancer and was uh, poor and couldn't afford the treatment to uh, relieve the pain and the even the potential curing of it. So I did what blokes do and uh, organised a committee meeting. <laughs> By the time we had the committee meeting the next week, sadly, she had died. Mm. So we still had the meeting and I said, this can't happen again. We've got to go out there and have some money on hand you know, to help in an emergency, some of our own. At the same time, and I can mention this guy's name, I, well, I've been being recorded, I won't mention his name. We had a... Of a star runner, he was the world. He broke Emil uh, Zatopek's record in February of this year, 56, uh, for one of the distances, uh, you know, something like five miles. By the time the um, Olympics were held in November, he was clapped out. Of course, we knew nothing about that tapering or how to do things, but he was a hell of a drinker. This bloke, and I live in Carlton, and so did this bloke. And I used to, quite an educated bloke. He was a school headmaster and all that, but he was a victim of the grog and. Anyway, I saw him a couple of times and um, he didn't have an Olympic blazer, so I gave him a, a green jacket that I'd had, a stupid colour I'd bought for some reason, and he I got him a, a, another pocket done by the Olympic people and he was happy as Larry. But he told me over a couple of drinks one day that he was going to get off the grog in a reverse way the way he used to do his training. <laughs> so, you know, working, instead of working up, working down. <laughs> so I said to the Genius. committee... Yeah. So I said, well, it, we've lost this swimmer but we've got to help this other guy. These, uh, he, he indicated he wants to get off the grog, so let's send him to it. Anyway, so the idea was we sent a letter to every Olympian in Victoria for funds. 
The first check we got was from the bloke we're trying to help. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you can't win. <laughs> you can win. That's a lovely, lovely story about um, about everyone sticking together. Um, and, and I think that's it. Um, I would love to go all afternoon, but we only have that beautiful show and tell out there uh, for the next little while. Please enjoy that. And uh, thank you for coming along. And please thank our guests, uh, Matthew Klugman, Tim Hogan and Leon Wiegard. Thank you. Thank you.